Hello, it's Scott Manley here. The James Webb Space Telescope will be the biggest telescope in space when it is unfolded, easily superseding Hubble's aperture. And this is just the latest in a long history of bigger and bigger telescope apertures, which goes back, well, centuries. For most of human history, the study of space was carried out with a device that we affectionately call the Mark I eyeball, with an aperture of only a few millimetres, not really enough to capture huge amounts of photons. But the good news is that most people do get two of these for free. And I hear that if you're worried about the aperture, you can actually help that a little by consuming alcohol, which dilutes, dilates the pupil and makes things a lot more fun, although it does impede your ability to make scientific uh, observations. Anyway, telescopes were the original space probes. And, and while Hans Lippershey is credited with the earliest description of a telescope in 1608, it's thought that telescopes might have existed prior to this, but were somewhat secret due to their military utility. But once the design was public, others were quick to begin making their own devices and using them for astronomical observations. While I was growing up, I was taught that Galileo was the first to document the skies with a telescope, discovering the cratered surface of the moon, turning his telescope to the sun and seeing sunspots, and somehow after that he was still able to look at Jupiter and find four moons, which we now call the Galilean moons. But there's evidence that there were others who actually predated his work on all of these. English mathematician Thomas Harriot used a Dutch-made telescope to observe the moon and the sun, and see some of these features. And Simon Marius is likely to have discovered the moons of Jupiter first. In fact, we use his names, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Uh, Galileo wanted to name the moons after his wealthy patrons. But Galileo, he had to build his own telescopes based on descriptions he read, and he quickly took the design and improved upon it, raising the magnification and the aperture. He made a 3.8 centimeter aperture telescope that could magnify 20 times. And as a consequence, Galileo's map of the moon is vastly superior to Harriet's, showing features which we would recognize from today's photographs. Now, as you can imagine, astronomers then wanted bigger and better and larger instruments to see more and more detail. But these were primitive refractors and the optical technology of the day suffered from uh, many problems, including chromatic aberration, where different colours of light would be refracted by different amounts and would therefore come to focus at different distances. Also, spherical aberration, where the simple lens geometry meant that light falling on different parts of the lens would come to focus at different distance, distances. And the way they dealt with this was by increasing the focal length to reduce these effects. And so telescopes would become extremely long. Polish astronomer Johann Hevelius would build a massively long telescope, with the largest of which was 45 meters long supported by cables and hanging from a 30 meter tall tower. But others, such as Christian Huygens and his brother Constantine, used the aerial telescope, where there was no tube, just a lens mounted on a pole and an eyepiece connected to it by a piece of wire. So observers would hold the eyepiece, pull it tight so they could find the focal length and then use that to look through the lens and observe the targets. Huygens, by the way, also invented a, a new eyepiece design with doublets to reduce uh, chromatic aberration. But yeah, his brother Constantine was probably responsible for the largest telescope of the 17th century, a 22 centimeter aerial refractor with a focal length of 64 meters. But this was decades after Huygens' major discoveries, which were made with more modest instruments. But soon, the largest telescopes in the world would no longer be refractors. In 1668, Isaac Newton came up with a solution to the problem of chromatic aberration. He designed a telescope with mirrors rather than lenses, and while his prototype only had an aperture of 3.3 centimeters, it was an important step forward. Not only because it eliminated this effect, allowing for more compact telescopes, but eventually, it allowed large mirrors, which would be easier to make than large lenses. And all large modern telescopes are based on mirrors. Newton wasn't the only scientist to design a telescope at this time. Uh, five years prior to Newton, a Scottish mathematician called James Gregory formulated a design for a telescope that used a parabolic primary mirror and a concave ellipsoid secondary 
uh, which would focus the light through a hole in the primary mirror. This was much more complex than Newton's simple spherical primary and flat secondary, and as a result, Gregory was unable to acquire mirrors with the correct geometry to realise his design. It would be a decade after he designed it that Robert Hooke was finally able to make a small example. And then Hooke would subsequently make a device that was 18 centimetres aperture, which I think may have been the largest uh, at the time in the world. It didn't perform particularly well, unfortunately. And there was another design that came out around the same time, which was uh, published in a French journal and credited to a mathematician named Cassegrain. And we're not actually sure of his full name. Uh, the Cassegrain uses a parabolic primary and an ellipsoid convex secondary. So if you look at the Gregorian and the Cassegrain side by side, the main difference is the curvature of the secondary is reversed, and the Cassegrain secondary mirror is closer to the primary, in front of the focal point. So that actually allows the telescope to be more compact still. Um, so anyway, the thing was, Newton, he actually published a scathing critique of this design. It, it wasn't exactly fair, but the criticism stuck, and Cassegrain sort of faded into obscurity. But the Cassegrain design would eventually become the basis for most modern telescope designs. But reflectors couldn't complete with refractors just yet. Even if you had a slightly larger aperture ref uh, reflector, the refractor is superior because it lacks any secondary mirrors to obstruct the light. And also, the mirror material used at the time wasn't a particularly good reflector of light. Newton's telescope would only pass through about 16% of the light that entered the device. Glass mirrors with a primary reflective surface hadn't been invented yet, so early reflectors were made uh, with metal, uh, an alloy, speculum alloy, which is primarily two-thirds copper and one-third tin, with other metals added to the formula. I've heard that Newton used arsenic in his mirrors as well, which is <laughs> an interesting choice. But it took decades for them to figure out how to make mirrors that were of sufficient size and quality to compete with the aerial refractors. John Hadley made many steps forward in solving these problems, and from the 18th century onwards, all of the world's largest telescopes would be reflectors. But that's not to say that the reflectors reign supreme in terms of scientific merit. For the 1700s, the reflectors boasted larger apertures, but in my opinion, the scientific work of note was done on smaller devices. Also, chromatic aberration problems with refractors were solved, and you know, with the invention of the achromatic doublet and the apochromatic triplet, which eliminated the need for these really long focal lengths. Anyway, um, James Short, a Scotsman, would become known as the constructor of the best Gregorian telescopes in the mid-1700s. And he would build lots of telescopes, uh, several large ones for his uh, customers, who were mostly wealthy aristocracy. The largest, I believe, is an 18-inch or 45.7 centimetre device, which he built for the King of Spain in 1752. Now, Short died in 1768, and apparently none of his contemporaries had learned any skills from him. Um, in 1761, Father Noel, the custodian of Louis XV's collection of scientific instruments, built a huge Gregorian telescope with a primary mirror of 23 and a half inches, or 60 centimetres, easily the largest in the world. You know, truly a telescope fit for a king. Unfortunately, it kind of sucked, so he spent another four years trying to fix it, and ultimately I don't think that it did much in the way of science. Reverend John Mitchell constructed a 30-inch aperture telescope around 1780. Now, John Mitchell was ahead of his time astronomically. He was the first person to suggest a black hole, a body where the gravitational field is strong enough to trap light. After his death, uh, the 76 centimetre telescope he'd built would be bought by William Herschel for the sum of £30. And that's quite a, quite a good deal. But 76 centimetres wasn't enough for Herschel, who constructed probably the first telescope with an aperture of over a metre. The primary mirror had a diameter of 120 centimetres, or just under 48 inches. The design didn't use a secondary. Instead, the observer would sit on a platform at the top of the tube looking down it, at the focal point uh, with eyepieces to focus the light. So the telescope took four years to build, and it was completed in 1789. The tube would be 
40 feet or 12 meters long and the primary mirror uh, massed about half a ton. And actually primary mirrors because back then the metal mirrors would corrode and they would need to be repolished and resurfaced. So they would swap them out while one was being cleaned up. But using this large telescope, Herschel was able to see that some of the fuzzy nebula in the catalogue of Charles Messier were actually clusters of stars. He also probably used this to discover Enceladus and Mimas, the moons of Saturn. It was something of a tourist attraction as well. The 40-foot telescope was frequently visited by dignitaries who would be also visiting the king at Windsor Castle, which just happened to be nearby. And while the 40-foot wouldn't be superseded for 45 years, it stopped being used in 1815 and would eventually be dismantled by his son, John Herschel, in 1839, but not before he made it the subject of photographic history by taking the first photograph on glass, showing the telescope with all its structure. A few years later, William Parsons, the Earl of Ross, began construction on a telescope that would be nicknamed the Leviathan. With a 72-inch, 183cm mirror, its light-gathering ability would be unmatched for 70 years, and using it, the details of, of Nebula became visible to observers. The Leviathan was the first telescope that showed the spiral structure of galaxies. It likely would have shown a whole lot more if it wasn't built in Ireland. It, it's an amazing country. But the weather isn't really the most accommodating for telescopes. Um, yeah, I mean, it's called the Emerald Isle because it's green, and it's green because it rains a lot. Anyway, look, uh, I think the Leviathan would actually also be the largest telescope built with a metal mirror. Well, at least on Earth, because the JWST has a segmented metal mirror for mass reasons. But towards the end of the 19th century, glass mirror technology had finally developed enough that they could start building telescopes with these. So the Leviathan's monstrous aperture would be superseded in 1917 by the 100-inch or 2.5-meter reflector at Mount Wilson in California. And this is the first of the telescope that I've talked about that actually looks like a modern telescope with a large rotating observatory dome, motor-driven mount, and accommodations for astronomical instruments rather than eyepieces. While the Leviathan had let humans see the spiral structure of galaxies, Edwin Hubble would use this telescope to prove that galaxies are outside of the Milky Way, and Fritz Zwicky would find the first evidence for dark matter in our galaxy. In 1949, the 200-inch Hale telescope at Palomar in the south of California would take the title of largest telescope. It's named for George Ellery Hale, who had also uh, designed the 100-inch telescope. And uh, he unfortunately died before this would be completed. Construction started in the 1930s, but at the outbreak of World War II meant that the telescope construction was lower priority than the war effort. Uh, the 5.1 meter mirror was also supposed to be made of fused quartz, but Corning had developed a new borosilicate glass with low thermal expansion, and they called this new material Pyrex. The mirror was also uh, designed with a honeycomb structure in it uh, so that it would reduce the mass. Without it, the telescope would have had a 36-ton mirror. Instead, it was only 18. And also, I think this is the largest optical telescope to use an equatorial mount. Um, the telescope, by the way, still in active use today, still doing modern observations. Uh, in the 1970s, the Soviet Union would build a 6-meter telescope named the BTA-6, Bolshoi Telescope alt Azimutin. I don't know, I can't say it's Russian, but basically uh, for this was a large telescope with an alt azimuth mount, and unfortunately for various reasons, it was never really able to perform as well as it should because of turbulent atmosphere from the nearby mountains. Um, in the 90s, the first of the Keck telescopes came online in 1993. That had a 10-meter aperture made from 36-part segmented mirror. Uh, the Keck Observatory is actually a pair of telescopes side-by-side side on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And the mirror system includes motors to adjust the curvature of the mirror, since a mirror of this size would normally sag under its own weight. And finally, in the 21st century, the largest single optical telescope is the 10.4 meter Gran Telescopio Canarias on the summit of La Palma in the Canary Islands. However, some sources claim the large binocular telescope on Mount Graham in Arizona is larger because it can combine both of its 8.4 aperture mirrors into a larger aperture. <laughs>
but then, you know, if you're going to make that argument, the very large telescope has four 8.2 meter mirrors that can work together. So anyway, looking forwards, the next decade, we have many larger telescopes. There's the giant Magellan telescope, which will use seven 8.4 meter mirrors in a single array. The 30 meter telescope in Hawaii will use 492 mirror segments to create an aperture of 30 meters. And finally, the extremely large telescope in Chile using 798 mirror segments to create a 39.3 meter aperture device. That is about 7,000 times the aperture of that classic human eye, 50 million times the light gathering power, and paired with instruments that can see things no eyeball is sensitive to. But while the big telescopes have eclipsed the Mark I eyeball, they still haven't taken away the simple joys of being able to look up at the dark sky and experience first-hand wide-angle views of the cosmos. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.